607 BCE. This is a cornerstone date for the organization, isn't it? It shows definitely how 1914 was the beginning of Christ's invisible presence. But is that actually what was taught under Joseph Rutherford? We've now gone over how Nathan Knorr instituted no blood transfusions starting in 1944, how he then instituted the disfellowshipping arrangement as we know it today in 1952. Before we go into 607 BCE, we need to learn about one other person, Fred Franz. Now this might seem like trivial information, but it is relevant. In this video, as well as future videos, you'll come to find out why. Fred Franz attended the University of Cincinnati, where he studied liberal arts, Latin, and classical Greek with the intention of becoming a Presbyterian preacher. According to court documents from a 1954 trial, Franz admitted he did not graduate. He completed six semesters, earning 84 credits only. He dropped out in the middle of his junior year, the spring of 1914. According to Franz's own college transcript, his major language studies were in classical Greek, in which he only accumulated 21 semester hours. There was only one course in Biblical Greek, offered then at the University of Cincinnati. According to the 1911 College Catalog, page 119, the course was titled The New Testament, a course in grammar and translation. It was a two-hour course, which was nothing more than a survey of New Testament Greek. It had a different grammar system from that of classical Greek that Fred Franz had studied. He also learned a basic understanding of Hebrew. Yet, due to this short college education on Greek and his basic understanding of Hebrew, he was known to all as the Bible scholar of that day. Fred Franz accounts that he was baptized on April 5, 1914. He became a Bethel family member in Brooklyn in 1926, becoming a member of the editorial staff as a Bible researcher and writer for the organization's publications. He also became the leading figure in the writing of the New World Translation due to his knowledge of Greek and Latin. Now, I will be doing a video regarding that translation shortly. See, Nathan Knorr was not a Bible scholar. He was an administrator that turned the organization into the well-oiled machine that we see today. Since Franz claimed to know Greek and Latin from his college days, Nathan Knorr relied upon him for his deep study of the Bible, but we went over just how much education he had received regarding Biblical Greek, two hours. He also replaced Hayden Covington as the Vice President of the Washtenaw Bible and Tract Society in 1945. I went over that in the video regarding blood transfusions. In 2010, we received new understanding regarding the generation teaching. David Splane explained that we can use Fred Franz as an example of one of the last members of the Anointed Alive in 1914, suggesting that the generation would include any individual anointed up until his death in 1992 at the earliest, extending the generation out further. Now, why does any of this matter? because it was Fred Franz who explained to Nathan Knorr that it was not 606 BCE that Jerusalem fell, as Charles Russell and Joseph Rutherford had taught. He stated that the two former faithful servants had not taken into account the zero year, that the fall of Jerusalem actually happened in 607 BCE, not 606 BCE something that all witnesses believe to this day. But how correct is that date of 607? 
To find out, we need to do a little research on the history of the fall of Jerusalem. What we're going to do is use the Encyclopedia Britannica as our reference material. Why? Because the organization has used the Encyclopedia Britannica multiple times in the past for information and references, so it's something that we should be able to trust. So let's see what the encyclopedia has to say. Here we see that Nebuchadnezzar was born around 630. He started his military career as a young man around 610, and then it goes on to state his military exploits up to 604 BCE. It shows that Nebuchadnezzar started his reign in 605 BCE. Now, it's important to know that at that time, the years ran opposite than they do now. Instead of going forward, as the Gregorian calendar now does, the years went backwards. That means his reign started two years after 607 BCE. So right there, that in itself is a red flag, because how could he have taken over Jerusalem as king in 607 BCE when he wasn't even king? He became king two years later in 605 BCE. It then goes on to state that the Jews' captivity was in 598, 597, and 587, 586, formally ending in 538 BCE. It goes on to show about the 70 years after which the temple was rebuilt. Now, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, we have constant articles regarding 607 BCE, the 70 weeks of years, as well as the seven times. But the encyclopedia states the fall of Jerusalem happened between 9 to 21 years after 607 BCE. I showed you earlier that Charles Russell and Joseph Rutherford put the fall of Jerusalem at 606 BCE. You have to understand, this was way before any archaeological findings. It was thought at that time that Jerusalem fell in 606, so Joseph Rutherford just went along with that line of thinking, putting the 2520 year mark at 1914 when Jesus took his throne invisibly by that date. Joseph Rutherford actually changed 1914 as being the start of Armageddon, as Charles Russell had taught, to Christ being enthroned invisibly. In 1922, he changed that doctrinal thinking to what we know today. Up to 1922, Jesus' invisible presence began in 1874. So because 606 was the thinking of that day in 1922, we have the doctrinal teaching of 607 BCE today. This was due to the increased light given by Fred Franz regarding the zero year. But it did not affect the year 1914, changing it to 1915, as adding a year would normally do. This thought is clearly not a correct date according to all historians and the Bible. See, archaeologists and historians' findings and the Bible's chronology actually match. The Babylonians were known as meticulous history keepers. They wrote everything down, so historians have much to work with regarding that time. It is a widely accepted fact that the fall of Jerusalem was not 607 BCE, but 20 years later. So what of Fred Franz zero year and 607 BCE? If that is not the actual historical date, then the 2,520 years from 607 doesn't mean anything. If that is the case, then 1914 is meaningless as far as chronology goes. I asked my dad this question regarding 607. I showed him how a return visit, I couldn't say that I was the one actually looking into it, pointed this out to me. His answer was, it doesn't matter because we know that 1914 is a significant pivotal date. The patent answer all witnesses will give you 
But how can that be the date if the start of the 2,520 year mark is not correct? They're literally 20 years off. Like I said, all witnesses firmly believe that 607 BCE is the actual date of the fall of Jerusalem. That's something that they are taught in all the publications, and they are completely discouraged from doing any outside research outside of J.W. Orr. So, how would they know otherwise? All of the organization's teachings are based on 1914, but since 607 BC is not a correct date, then logically it would mean that nothing happened in the heavens in 1914. But it is hard to argue or disprove or prove invisibility, isn't it? So if 1914 is not correct, that begs the question, is 1919 really a date that has significance for the organization? The year that Jesus chose the Watch Our Bible and Track Society, removing them from spiritual captivity. But then it goes deeper. If 1914 is not correct, and neither is 1919, is this truly Jehovah's organization? How can they claim to be God's channel of communication here on earth if none of the dates match up with the Bible? If 1914 and 1919 are not actual dates where anything happened, what does that do to the rest of our beliefs? It really is a house of cards, isn't it? Take those two dates out of any equation. What is the organization based on? The organization cannot admit that they are wrong about 607 BCE, which is very easily proven. Actually, doing a simple Google search on the fall of Jerusalem would surprise you. But like I said, if 607 is not correct, that means 1914 is not correct, which means that 1919 is not correct, which would mean the organization was not actually chosen as God's channel in 1919. But as a witness, you wouldn't even think about checking that date out. Why would you? The organization is God's true channel. So what you are being told is absolute truth and law. It comes from God. Everything else is to be considered apostate lies. Sadly, if you've watched any of my other videos, this is not the only biblical doctrine that the organization has gotten wrong, is it? That's why it's so important to learn the history of the organization outside of the organization. Have you heard of any of this before? This particular doctrine is so easily proven wrong, but not within the organization's publications, but the governing body have told all witnesses as truth. It's something that I firmly believed, something that I never even contemplated or thought of looking elsewhere to find out if it was wrong. We've now gone over the doctrine of no blood transfusions. We've gone over the installment of disfellowshipping. We have now just gone over the doctrinal teaching of 607 and 1914. My next video will be on whether or not the organization used an actual spiritist referencing his translation of his Bible for their publications. What significance is that really? Well, come back to find out. You might just be surprised at what you hear and see. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like Algorithms. It helps it go out to other people. And if you really enjoyed it, please subscribe so that you can follow along for more. And as always, thank you for watching.